Welcome to another inspirational message from Chowdean Community Church, Gateshead. For more information about Chowdean, visit www.chowdean.org.uk. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Well, the question I want to ask this morning is what matters to God? What matters to God? And I think possibly there is a video that was supposed to be being played. So if you'd like to show that, Kath. Right, so, what matters to God? Last week, Sam started us off with our series, Created for Significance. Um, And he made us think about whether we are doing our best to invite everyone to hear about God. And he asked some very hard-hitting questions about our attitudes towards people. Now, This week, we are continuing on with that series, and it follows really well by asking this question, what matters to God? I suppose the easy answer to that is, well, everything. God made this world, and so it follows that everything in it and everyone in it matters. I guess we could end now. I could sit down, you could all breathe a sigh of huge relief, and we could go home early for lunch. Um, But is it really as simple as that? I think maybe the question that we should be asking is, what really matters to God? What really matters to God? Well, people, that is what really matters to God. You matter to God. Every single one of you, whether you're young or whether you're old, you matter to God. Now, why do I say that? Is it just wishful thinking? Is it one of those trite little things you see on Facebook, you know, surrounded by flowers, you matter to God, and everybody shares it or likes it, and it makes you feel good? Or is it actually true? Do you matter to God? What's the evidence? It would be wrong to make such a statement without backing it up from God's word, the Bible. Everything we say should be backed up with proof from the Bible. So let's have a look at that proof. And I'd like to read three really well-known parables this morning. But this time, have a look at them with a fresh pair of eyes to see what they are saying to us. If you are not a Christian, what are they saying? If you've been a Christian for a while, what are they saying? And maybe you're just interested in this Christian stuff. What's it going to say to you? And you may want to get a pen and paper too, because we're going to look at lots of different verses along our journey this morning. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that there is absolutely nothing worse than losing something, is there? I personally think that there is an alternate dimension where all the odd socks go. You put a pair of socks in the washing machine, but they don't come out again, do they? Keys. What is it with keys? Oh, and I don't mention the television remote controls. It happens, doesn't it? We all lose things. In our house over the years, it would be fair to say that my boys were not good at finding things. Daniel, once lost his wallet, cancelled all his cards, etc., only to go up and find it lying on his bed in clear view. And you just need to ask my daughters. The tradition still continues today with my boys, my son-in-laws, and now my grandsons. 
They cannot see what is right in front of them. And I was telling Sarah, my daughter, this, and she went, Mum, Ben, my grandson, wears glasses. And he came down earlier this week in a right strop. Can't find my glasses, you know, hurling cushions, getting stroppy. Where did you last have them? I don't know. I've looked everywhere. And um, Naomi, who's sitting there on Hannah's lap, who's two, went upstairs, came out. Me found your glasses. And they were just on his bed. I rest my case. However, I can't really speak as I have a tendency to look for my glasses. And I either find them because I'm wearing them or they're on top of my head. Does anybody else do that if they wear glasses? It's a nightmare, isn't it? And you feel so foolish. Finding things can be a bit of a hit and miss affair, very much dependent on how carefully we look for something and sometimes a little bit on luck, I think. Not that I believe in luck. I heard about a fisherman once who was dredging the lake in Austria in the same spot where he had dropped his wallet 20 years earlier. And behold, he found the same wallet with all the money and the cards still in it. Now, the chances of that happening must have been pretty slim. But the stories that Jesus told were not hit and miss at all. They all had a purpose and they all had a meaning. And the ones we're going to read this morning are all about something being lost and then found. So if you've got your Bibles to hand, have a look at Luke chapter 15 and we're going to read verses 1 to 24. Uh, if you haven't got your Bible at hand, it'll appear on the screen behind me. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need not to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion on him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. 
Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So the first question we need to ask is, why did Jesus tell these particular stories? Jesus told the stories because the stuck-up, righteous, self-effacing Pharisees thought they were too good, and they were muttering about who Jesus kept company with. I also think Jesus told these stories because the people listening could associate themselves with the characters and, like us, understand a search for something that's precious and important and the frustration of losing something. Now, I know these parables are well known, but I want to have a look at them a little deeper, this time against the backdrop of what we're looking at today. What matters to God? And I think the first thing to note is to whom these parables, what's a parable? An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. What these stories and who they're told to. Verse 1 says this, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. The tax collectors were not well liked. I suppose they would have been very much viewed upon like the collaborators um, in World War II. They took money off the people, gave it to the Roman occupiers, and took a little bit on the side for themselves as well. But they weren't the only ones listening. The Bible puts it as sinners. Well, I mean, that could encompass anything, couldn't it? At that time, I think it probably encompassed the very dredges of society. The equivalent today may be of prostitutes, drug dealers, thieves... There could have been unfaithful husbands or unfaithful wives. There could have been murderers. You name it, just like there is today, they were probably there and they were listening. Now, do you notice the connection there with the people invited to the banquet in Sam's reading last week? And Jesus was spending time with these people. He was telling them this story as an encouragement to them and as a rebuke to those Pharisees who were listening. So the first point that we need to remember is this. The parables show that Jesus loves those that the world despises. Those that the world thinks has no value. Jesus wasn't found talking and eating with the wealthy and the well-thought-of people at that time. No, he was found with those that nobody else wanted to be with and those that were looked down on in society. It didn't matter to him that they were not the high society or the respectable people of the day. These people mattered to him. They mattered to him just as they were. I think that the first two stories, the story of the lost sheep and, and the coin, are on the most basic level, both the same. But the first one emphasizes the love of the shepherd searching for the lost sheep, leaving the other sheep and caring for just the one. And the second one, I think, focuses more on the diligent search for the lost coin. All three stories, however, are a defense of the offer of the good news to the lost, despite the official criticism of the, t of the people at that time. Luke 5, verse 32 says this, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. When I was preparing this and reading that verse, I was reminded of the weekend away when Paul Scanlon came to speak to us. Do you remember his talk? He talked about when he started his church, the people started to come in. But they were people who were coming in that the people who were already there couldn't cope with because they weren't nice people. They were people who had problems, who didn't fit into boxes, just like the ones that Jesus is talking about here. And he said that some of the people in that church left because they couldn't cope with something outside the little box that they had been used to. 
And it made me think about this. God loves the unlovable. God loves the unwanted. Do you feel sometimes to be unlovable and unwanted? Do you wonder what people would really think of you if they knew what you had done in the past or the thoughts that were sometimes in your head? Are you floundering along trying to be a good person, but you just get it wrong all the time? Do you think that God couldn't possibly care about you? Well, what else do these stories go to show us? Well, I think the second thing is this. Jesus came to save those that the world despises. God didn't just love those that were despised and leave it at that. No, he was proactive in doing something about them. If you love someone and you see them in danger, in real trouble, you don't just stand there shouting, I love you, and do nothing, do you? If there was a fire in a house and you saw the person you loved in that fire, what would you do? If you saw the person you loved drowning, what would you do? God is no different. What would be the point of saying he loved us and then doing nothing to help us? How can we see that from these verses? Just always go back to what it says. Well, the central character in each of these stories is looking, is searching desperately and diligently for that which was lost. That character represents our loving Heavenly Father searching out us. Not just in a casual manner, but with a great fervor. It matters to the shepherd that he finds the sheep. It matters to the woman that she finds the coin. Now, it's been suggested that the coin was probably especially important to her because it might have come from her dowry. At that time, they often wore ten coins across their forehead. It might just have simply been a denarii, which was equivalent to a day's wage. It kind of really doesn't matter. Either way, that coin was really important to her, and she was going to look for it. Incidentally, and for the ladies here, when researching this talk, I read a commentary, a rather tongue-in-cheek commentary, that jokingly mentioned that Jesus put in about the woman looking for the coin Because if the story had had a man in it, he would have looked for the coin and then he would have had to go and get his wife to look for it anyway. Um, That isn't the case, but it did make me smile. Now, these verses show that the hunt and the search for the missing things were their priority. It mattered to them. And thirdly, we can see that God celebrates When those that he loves and came to save are found. Jesus said it not only at the end of the first story, but again at the end of the second. Have a look. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And the father in the parable of the lost son said, it was fitting to celebrate and be glad For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. There was a celebration. God loves the lost and celebrates when they come to him. Jesus said, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent or do not think they need to repent. John 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever, whoever, whoever believes in him might be saved. God loves the lost so much he was willing to sacrifice his Son to save them. So we've seen three things from these stories so far. One, that Jesus loves those that the world despises. Two, that Jesus came to save those that the world despises. And three, God celebrates in heaven when those that are lost turn from their sin to God. Okay, do we sit down now? Just knowing that these matter to God are not enough. 
Just knowing it's not enough. How does it impact on our lives today? Well, I think that these stories show what matters to God, but they have a twofold purpose. One, if you are not a Christian, and two, if you are a Christian. Oh, that, that means everybody then, doesn't it? If you're not a Christian or if you are, that's everybody. Let's look at it first, though, if you are not a Christian. If you don't know God, wow, be encouraged. He loves you. He sent his son to die on a cross for you. That is an amazing truth. But knowing that truth is not enough. You have to do something about it. Look at the image on the screen behind me. What do you see? It's quite faint. It's a man knocking on a door. And it's the painter's interpretation of Jesus knocking on a door. It says in Revelation 3, verse 20, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. But have you noticed the door? Have you noticed the door? There is no door handle on the outside, is there? The door can only be opened from the inside. You have to open the door to God and let him in. Having heard how much you matter to him and how much he loves you and did for you, the question is, are you going to open that door? Are you going to open that door? And for those of you who have been Christians for a while, maybe a very long time, you've opened that door. You've let Jesus in. What can you take from these stories? The first thing, we should love what Jesus loves. But what does that mean practically? How can we love what Jesus loves? Well, I think... There are four things as an action plan, as individuals that you and I need to take away, and as a church. It says in Matthew 28, verse 19, therefore go, go, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. The first thing is we need to be actively preaching the gospel and telling people about God and his love. That's the first thing we need to do. It says in Matthew 9, verse 38, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. I was reading some statistics. They say that only one in ten Christians have ever led someone to Christ. That means 90% of Christians keep their faith to themselves or are silent believers. The second thing we need is we need to pray for more people to be prepared to witness for God. Are you? Are you prepared to do that? When Paul wrote in his first letter to the Corinthians, he said this in verse 22 of chapter 9, To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. Paul never compromised in what he said, and neither should we, but he did try to put himself in the shoes of those who are different from him. And we must do the same if we are to win souls to Christ. So the third thing we need to do is we need to open the door and communicate with those around us in a way that demonstrates love and shows that we are no better than anyone else. I was reminded when I was thinking on this verse and preparing this talk of David Wilkerson in The Cross and the Switchblade. He was witnessing to a boy who had no shoes on and he was so convicted to take his own shoes off, he gave them to the boy 
and said, wear them, put them on. The very sight of him walking down the road back to his car and just his socks spoke volumes to those watching and led many of the lads to listen to what he had to say. Would you do that? We have to show that we're no better than anyone else. We have to show love. We need to open the door and we need to communicate that love. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and the one who is wise saves lives. If we are to be successful in our search for the lost, then we need to be a branch that is attached to the tree, the tree being Jesus. So the fourth thing you need to do, we need to remain faithful. We need to remain in him if we are to be fruitful in our service. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and the one who is wise saves lives. We need to be committed to putting him first in our lives. So as I ask the band to come back up, let's have a look at what we've learned this morning. Basically, it can be summed up like this. What matters to God? Two things. The lost and those who are despised and rejected by others. The ones that nobody else thinks it's good enough. It matters to him that these come to faith in him and start new lives. He loves them and he died to save them. And the second thing is, we are to love those that Jesus loved, the unlovable. We are to love those that Jesus loved and to go out of our way to serve him diligently in searching them out and telling them the good news of the gospel. What are you going to do today? If you don't know Jesus, are you finally going to open that door to the knocking and let him in? And if you do know Jesus, are you going to diligently serve him and love and seek out those who are unlovable, the ones you might not be comfortable with? Are you going to love and seek out those who are unlovable? Amen. This is the end of this message. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about our church, please visit www.chowdean.org.uk and please take a minute to rate our podcast on iTunes.